Warning, the following video is a parody of the Everything Wrong With series of videos by CinemaSins. Most opinions shared are not intended to be taken seriously since they do not reflect my actual opinions on the game. So without any more delays, let's rip into Miitopia one last time and I hope you enjoy the video. So for some reason, in the Switch version of Miitopia, the transition from story introduction to showing the main character for the first time is a bit off. Actually, come to think of it, the Switch version does have a fair share of technical flaws that the 3DS version didn't even have. Most notably, the frame drops when taking out multiple enemies at the same time. While this is a minor thing, it just doesn't seem right for the system with more power to chug at any point, considering frame drops were close to non-existent in the 3DS version, and the opening transition worked perfectly. The fact that this is only sin number 2 and I'm already recycling a reoccurring cinema sins gag, because the MC of Miitopia is showing us what he has learned at the Prometheus School of Running Away From Things, and honestly, I cannot blame the guy, because while Miitopia's whole concept of faces being on monsters may sound fun from our point of view, since Mies can literally represent anybody, meaning you can make something like Rock Squidward for example, from their perspective, it's honestly very grim and kinda terrifying. While I did speak to everyone in town before going over to the mayor, guess what? If you decide to skip out on someone and just say yes, well, the mayor buys it and you can continue on. <laughs> Moron. You're starting with Greenhorn? I was literally being chased away by a rock moth a few minutes prior to you coming here. You clearly started invading somewhere else. Whereabouts though? No damn clue. <laughs> Kinda convenient of Dark Lord Tinky Winky to leave me, the main character, unscathed. And also, very f***ing convenient that the antique charm that Toriel gave me contained what I'm assuming is the soul of a guardian spirit, or in my case, a god, or we never would have actually been able to rescue Azriel and begin the adventure otherwise. <laughs> Kid, you do know Dark Lord Tinky Winky just reduced your hometown and its residents to total despair. With you being one of the victims, right? That would be like if I pretended to be... Uh... Name any evil person that still exists today that just one day comes over to where I live and made everything a complete and utter mess. Roll credits. This is literally the first level. We have not scored any treasure yet. Just some reward for saving Azriel, and also some honey from killing a rock moth. That's it. Okay, while I could buy the fact that the party always finds HP bananas and MP candies on the floor during their travels, because, well, RPG games in general just work like that, I do not buy or understand the fact that they always eat these items without taking the peels or wrappers off of them first. Something else that kind of bothered me from the transition from Miitopia 3DS to Miitopia Switch was the fact that no new amiibo costumes were introduced at all. Miitopia 3DS had a total of 26 different amiibo costumes that you could unlock if you scanned in their respective amiibos. Other characters' amiibos would result in you being rewarded with three game tickets, which become pretty easy to obtain much later on through other means. And plus, Nintendo franchises like Kid Icarus, Fire Emblem, and even Pokemon are not represented here in any way. Not even the Mii Fighter Amiibos do anything special, even though I feel like they should have gotten something unique, since this is a Mii game after all. Come on, the Mario Peach and Bowser Amiibos all provided unique functionalities in Super Mario Odyssey that couldn't be accessed through normal means, like temporary invincibility, and even help on finding the purple coins in a kingdom. Surely the Mii Amiibos could have gotten something unique to them in Miitopia. What could they have provided though? Let me know in the comments below because I couldn't think of an idea. And I know 99% of the viewers watching right now are probably smarter than I am. <laughs> Me? You? Are a moron, thinking that fighting Dark Lord Tinky Winky is a good idea right now. You and Cynthia as of right now are both only level 2, and your third team member literally just joined you this morning. 
Are you begging for a death wish or something? <laughs> Great Sage Ex Machina. Wait, what? How did Roman Gourmet Kirby here get past Serious Soldier Regirock? I thought Regirock could not allow unauthorized personnel to pass through without something like the mayor's introduction in hand. Does Kirby here deliver food to the king on a regular basis? I just decided to stop here for a quick snack before carrying on. What the f Once again, very convenient that when I bring up the situation at hand to the king, he immediately gets his face taken off of him. Dark Lord Tinky Winky must have taken his time to reach the castle to claim the king's face, considering I literally spent an entire night resting at an inn after beating Imp Marge Simpson. Septu somehow manages to consume the potion without taking the cook off of the bottle first. I have to save Asriel again? Are you fucking kidding me? Why are you not monitoring your kid at all times, Toriel? Or come to think of it, Asriel could have exited town from both the left and right sides. So why did no one here stop Asriel or call Toriel over to let her know that her son is about to wander off? This movement cycle, me and the game feels the exact same way about it too. Now how did the king get himself into the princess's chamber? Look at how big and wide the king is compared to the door. Did the king ask the guards right outside the room to just forcefully push his fat tub of lard in there? <laughs> oh, and speaking of this Prince Est, I think I've got a decent list of sins here to list off about him, since he's without a doubt the worst character in this game. So before we carry on, to the person who submitted the character Est, let me just say up front, I am so sorry to you for giving your me this role. So with the YouTuber apology out of the way, here we go. Rude behavior from the moment he is on screen. Name calling. Lies. If you lose to the Griffin boss you encounter on your way back to the castle, the guy literally talks down on your entire team, despite literally contributing nothing to the fight. Dude, if you feel like we ain't proper fighters, how about you get your ass in the ring and show everyone what you can actually do? Oh, and also, he takes credit for defeating the Griffin after we beat it. So, Grace cannot put up a fight against a few goblins, but can somehow get past all four guards in the castle and the king himself, which I don't see any proper way you can sneak around him. The only thing behind the king is the wall, and he has one pair of guards always standing in front of him, with his other pair of guards just being right outside the throne room. So, how did the guy sneak in without getting forced out or even detected by anyone for that matter? Princess whimpers in fear and runs away crying his eyes out, not even making an effort to rescue the princess, despite being his fiance. He didn't even ask to join us on the trip to Nightmare Tower to save her. He's actually more pathetic than the unreliable noble Grace, who actually puts in some effort despite still doing zero damage and getting completely destroyed in one hit. If Grace had a job of his own, like each member of my team does, He'd probably perform pretty decently after some time, as long as he also learns to build up courage alongside strength. Wouldn't you agree? Huh? Did the team seriously get so tired that they couldn't be bothered to walk back inside the tent they set up? How does no one here have any back or shoulder pain for just laying there for approximately 8 hours? My party members getting stolen by the Dark Lord will always be a sin, no matter how many times I play through this game. 
but instead of one sin, I will just give this moment one sin per stolen character throughout the adventure and leave it at that. Good? Good. <laughs> Kids, don't ever sit on a cactus. It's stupid, and likely, really painful. Well, I guess there is one more thing I could sin for this princessed character, that being the fact he is dumb enough to get scammed by the genie in the lamp. We all know genies grant three wishes, not just one. that. And also, did no one here seriously notice Desert Celebrity Inkling's wealth get yoinked after Freddy got released? I honestly find that very hard to believe. Pretzel, Lorelei, and <laughs> all forgot we were specifically going to the underground maze to get Desert Celebrity Inkling's gold back, despite literally accepting her request the day prior to Emmy Arcade joining the team. We interrupt Metopia to bring you Professor Oak from Pokemon. You, obviously. Oh, so this is how I knew in case you were wondering. Good job, Freddy. And also, this guy, and the fact that I have full control over who gets to fill your role, and also what your name is. Uh, Kyogre? Do you not notice that Groudon doesn't have a face on him anymore? The fact that you are still giving him crap, despite him being one of the Dark Lord's victims, is enough for me to say that you are just as much of an asshole as Prince Est is. Even after I rescue Groudon and return his face to him, Kyoga still gives him a hard time, despite what happened. Just... Just why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting the Mona Lisa. Hold on, does that mean Leonardo da Vinci is canonical to the Mii universe or something? Is he also canonical in other Nintendo franchises? Let me know in the comments below if there has been a hint or a cameo of da Vinci or any other historical figure in any other Nintendo game because that honestly sounds very interesting. Oh, this guy. The roving photographer. So, he is essentially a reoccurring character that you will meet several times throughout your adventure, kind of like the Quizmaster and Worried Explorer. But unlike them, this guy sucks. For a multitude of reasons. One, no one on the team gave consent to have their picture taken. Two, he mainly takes photos of the party facing a somewhat critical situation during battles, kind of like this photo on screen right now which is kind of messed up when you really think about it. And you know what? While I'm on that topic, I'm going to add an additional sin for every photo he took of my team going through some form of torment, pain, 
or a serious predicament. And of course, he also tries charging you for his photos. Granted it's only 20 gold, but any price above zero in my opinion is still asking for too much, considering he's literally charging me for snippets of my team's ongoing pain throughout the adventure. And last but not least, his camera goes beyond the fourth wall. So I guess this also counts as a breaking the fourth wall sin. Okay, how did the king get escorted from his castle to the oasis at the very end of next door? I don't see any carriage in sight that could have carried his blubber belly all the way out here. Are they trying to imply that Registeel and Regigigas carried him all the way out here, starting from the castle, then the arid frontier, at the beginning of next door desert, and then through Wetland Way, before finally making a stop at the oasis? I find that very hard to believe, considering the first time we ever encountered the king, they were really struggling to hold him up which is honestly not that surprising. I can totally imagine that one day, the king requests to go on a trip through the entire land of Metopia, so Registeel goes over to Regirock to ask for the keys which starts up the forklift they keep behind the castle, so they can escort the pork shop wherever he requests to be, without the risk of the guards straining their arms out, until eventually, the forklift gives in to the king's colossal weight and breaks down at the oasis where we meet him. F***ing twerky! And while I'm on the topic of the twerky, this next sin applies to the version that I'm playing on, which is the UK release, or PAL. Because when you defeat a twerky in this version of the game, it drops chicken curry, whereas in the US version, it drops turkey curry, which sounds about right, because twerky is a combination of twerk and turkey. So, where does the chicken come from when I kill a twerky? Chickens and turkeys are both birds, but they are not the same thing. Wait, what? So he fully knows that I have full capability of screenshotting any moment in the game, but still charges me anyway for the photos that he had taken during the adventure, which I can also screenshot when they are on display, actively avoiding the payment with no penalties whatsoever. Either this guy's messing with me, or he somehow did not think about this one oversight. As much as I love the Metopia tank, it pains me to say that it is without a doubt the worst job of the entire game playthrough wise. For one, the tank's overall speed stat is always zero, no matter what level it is, meaning it will always go last every turn in every battle. The only way you can actually buff the tank's speed stat is with the food that you get from defeating monsters during levels. The only reason why the tank in this footage is going first every round is because earlier on into the game, the roulette wheel had the chance of giving me the very rare Snurp Radish's grub, which buffs every single stat and every single Snurp Radish I got, I invested them into Pretzel, which became my tank me for this portion of the game. Another flaw that the tank has is the moves that it gets early on, because these attacks can cause quarrels with your party members if you use them too much. The first being Human Cannonball at level 3, then followed by Wild Shot at level 5. Human Cannonball is pretty self-explanatory. You can pick anyone in your current party as ammunition to fire at an enemy, which causes the person you shot to get slightly upset at you. Wild Shot is safer to use, but it's not as powerful as Human Cannonball. This attack will hit anyone entirely at random, mainly opposing enemies, but sometimes you will accidentally shoot one of your own party members, which just like Human Cannonball, makes party members slightly more upset at you. So your safest option until you get laser at level 10 is your standard attack, which believe it or not, is also flawed, because guess what? Every attack costs 2 MP, and if you don't have any MP to spare, well, too bad too sad, you can't do anything at all, and you'll have to wait to turn in the safe spot to get some MP back if you don't have any MP sprinkles to spare. So yeah, I love the tank for a multitude of other reasons, but the reasons shared here are just a few strikes against it. Fake out aside, I seriously wish I could fall asleep that fast too. About that, part two. And only the two elder sisters? Didn't all three of them have their guard down before they got ambushed by the monsters? How did the youngest one remain unscathed? Yeah, she's capable of holding her own in battle, 
but so are her older sisters, which also had their guard down at the time. Just saying, if I was the Dark Lord, I would have brought in a few more monsters to ensure that all three Fab Fairies would be spirited away, thus leaving the realm of the Fae completely defenseless. I would just like to point out as of this point in time, my current party consists of only three members, so Pretzel here literally snuck out of the inn to go and spy on Minty and Mystic in the park, leaving Rapidash the horse by himself back at the inn. What an asshole. Bravo, pretzel. Me. Uh, excuse me? The last time a party member decided to consume some of the orange liquid within this cave, they turned into a snail temporarily. And now, it just doesn't do anything? What are the rules here? I wonder what's for dinner. Just so you know, Dark Lord Tinky Winky, while you actually did manage to take the youngest Fab Fairy's face this time, this was the perfect moment for you to take all three of them. And I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you right now, good sir. This was worse than your first interaction with the Fab Fairies, because that time, they put up a fight against you in order to protect the retreat that they live in, and you managed to capture both the middle-aged and eldest Fab Fairies. This time, no fight was put up against you, and you resorted to just the youngest Fab Fairy, sparing the other two. Are you seriously trying to give me a fighting chance here? Because that's what it feels like. The Lazy Bones character, while not a jerk, he's quite possibly the most unnecessary character in this entire game. He has no impact on the story, he doesn't give you any items, and he's not even a boss battle. He's here, just cuz. DeviantArt, that's just DeviantArt the boss fight. The Macho costumes will always be a sin too. Many people I've spoken to do not like these kind of costumes, and considering I'm setting them here, that's enough for me to tell you that I do not like them either. Uh, yeah. About that, part three. Peter, how are you doing that? I, 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 don't, I don't know, Lois. I'm scared. Well, come down. I, I can't. I, I, I get help. Call somebody. Well, who, who do I call? I, I, I don't know. A, a police, a fire, a, a scientist. Call a scientist. Pray for your safety. What other Nintendo game have I seen that in before? Are you being serious right now, boy? I'm pretty sure physical contact with Magma would do way more damage than that. Uh, Great Sage Sayori, are you okay? Your wand seems to be going right through your face. This might just be a me thing, but seeing the pool tank be any color besides yellow, with the number 9 still being on it, just doesn't feel right to me. Because we all know what the 9 ball looks like. I would have honestly preferred if the different colored variants here had their respective numbers on them instead. How did Sebtoot not see Emmy Arcade? They were both on screen together for a split moment there. And plus, Emmy Arcade was looking in Sebtoot's direction just moments before he came on screen. How did he also not see him? You know, after watching this exchange again, that got me thinking, why does the Dark Lord leave some monsters roaming the world without a face on them? Because not long ago, Sayori told me that the monsters are incomplete and harmless without a face already attached to them. And as we've seen with many of the boss encounters I've made throughout the story so far, the Dark Lord mainly just poofs the monsters he creates into existence. And with all these boss encounters, there's one thing they all have in common, 
the Dark Lord gives them all a me face immediately. So it seems kind of impractical for him to leave some monsters roaming free without the necessary me faces required to make them whole and complete at hand first. Yeah it was, because our guardian spirit Godfriend decided to chip in and give us the most broken item in the game to help us contend with Cerberus. Yeah it's kinda on me for actually using them, but even then, the way I see it, when you get an in-game item for the first time and they give you a description or tutorial on how to use it, I feel like it's encouraged that you use that said item at that exact moment. <laughs> While I'm glad that worried explorer Kyle decided to turn around before doing anything, I still think it's on Pretzel here for just panicking behind him. Couldn't he have just said something as simple as turn around? So basically, the dragon boss isn't real. It can't hurt you. The dragon boss? Why does the color of the dragon change after we beat it in battle? Does the dragon's color indicate if it's in a hostile state or not? Kind of like either a Minecraft wolf or bee? Or is it because it had a me face attached to it? Dark Lord Tinky Winky, you have a giant electricity projectile that you almost use to annihilate Pretzel on the spot at the very beginning of the game, before you were stopped by Great Sage Theori. Why didn't you bother using that again during this boss fight? And also, how come you just stop attacking altogether when you summon two imp servants onto the field and essentially cut my team in half? You only have two more people left to deal with, since the faceless party members can't even do a single thing. And one more thing to point out, while this didn't happen again during this playthrough, if you saw my 100 more days in Metopia video, which I'd highly recommend checking out if you haven't seen it already, then you would know that when I fought the Dark Lord in that run, if one of my party members attacked him directly while he still had Imp Servants out on the field, then there is a chance that the Dark Lord will cower in fear and an Imp will stand in front of him to take the hit. Yep, that's the sin. The Dark Lord. The Dark Lord cowering in fear. What the f***? Okay, so not only does the team not notice the mysterious wisp that just flew out of the Dark Lord's necklace, but they also don't explain what's even going on here to Tinky Winky, who was just free from the Dark Curse moments ago, and rightfully confused over where he is or what even happened. And the fact that the Dark Curse goes unnoticed by everyone until the last second is what led to Pretzel almost becoming the true final boss of the main story. Does Dominic have to make five trips every time the team decides to go to another location? Because from how it looks here, he can only carry up to a maximum of four party members at a time. So, does he escort the first four party members here to the Traveler's Hub? Then go back to the Dark Lord's castle to pick up three more members of the party, get them to the hub, then go back to the castle again, and then bring over the final three members of the team to the hub? Sounds very tiring from Dominic's point of view, but considering the fact he likes helping others, I guess he doesn't really mind all that much. What the what? Did those penguins seriously just shake their backsides at me? Come on, wasn't twerky already enough? <coughs> I'm now fighting a piece of bread. Hamburger. Even though I'm not showing this at all throughout the entire runtime of the video so far, I just wanted to bring it up here while we were in Nimbus because this was originally going to be a sin in the video until I thought about it a little bit more. So every once in a while, someone in your party will come across a patch of grass in which you have the option if they should investigate it or not. 
One of the interactions you can get from this is you find a tiny kitten inside the grass, which originally I was going to sit by saying there's somehow a cat and grass in the sky. But considering Nimbus has a bunch of high tech looking buildings and even a robot factory that we go and visit later on, that would technically mean that Mies have been able to colonize the sky and also find ways to grow vegetation within clouds. But one of the other interactions you can get is finding a monkey within the grass, which then gets scared off and accidentally drops a half eaten HP banana, which the team decides to yoink for themselves, which A, my party is addicted to monkeys, and B, a half eaten banana still counts as one full banana, somehow. I think it's safe to say that no one likes the sickness mechanic in this game. I can kind of understand why it's here though, to mainly make the player switch up their team combinations every once in a while. But for the longest time, I always thought aside from an interaction within the inn, a party member getting over their cold was decided entirely at random. And I'm sure many people watching this video probably also thought the same thing when they played through the first time. Nope, it's actually determined by experience points. Depending on what level your sick party member is currently at, you will need to earn a certain amount of EXP in order to get them back on their feet, which I'm going to send because there's no hint anywhere in the game that clues you in on this information and the amount of times I just went through the first level of the game in hopes of recovering an ill party member as quickly as possible until I found out this information was immeasurable. <sighs> this f***ing UFO. I'm sorry, but the way Pretzel is moving here, it looks like he really needs to use the bathroom. It's a good thing this dog remained completely unscathed despite everything we threw at it during this boss battle. Otherwise, Cherry here would have probably killed us. Yeah, and since you brought those guys up, let me just say, while I appreciate you giving me the shield sprinkles now for the current predicament that we are in, I personally think it would have been a much smarter idea if he gave us them the first time we ever encountered a fiend, because... yeah. <laughs> What? How? How did he get in here? <laughs> Basically, every villain during the climax, ever. Um, Pretzel? The guy doesn't have a face on him. How do you not notice immediately that something is wrong with him? F***ing idiot. Okay, how did you also get in here? You are an explorer, so what was your method for getting inside the skyscraper that didn't involve running around looking for specifically shaped jewels? That is not a sword, that looks more like a club. Wait a minute. So bananas are created by hand or machinery in this world? Or is it just limited to HP bananas specifically? I kind of want to know. What? How did you- Oh, forget it. Just add this to the sin count, ding. Uh, no we won't. Even in other world, inns are still up and running here. I always found it ridiculous that in this game, the team always manages to conveniently stumble towards a brand new inn nearly every single day, but considering they are still somehow finding them within another dimension, I think this is the only logical conclusion that I can jump to. The god within the antique charm at the beginning of the game is the deity of well-placed inns. There's no other way to put it. My guy probably never walked into an inn as often as he did prior to acquiring the charm. They never had to make a payment to stay for the night. And why else would the team stumble across multiple inns within enemy territories like Nightmare Tower or the Dark Lord's Castle. How else can you put it? Sayori, you call yourself the Dark Lord, but your true form is the freaking sun? Something well known for being very bright?
we interrupt me, Toby, to bring you the opening to Teletubbies. And that's the only take I'm doing on this sin. I'm not saying that again. I said it in the original Everything Wrong With Me Tobia video. I'm saying it one more time here. No more. That's it. This attack. Wait a minute, if Sayori could use magic to seal the Dark Curse, why didn't she use that back at the Dark Lord's castle when it was trying to possess Pretzel? So essentially, the guy insisted on taking his own life because no one even paid attention to him in any way. All I can really say about that is holy shit. I know some Nintendo games do have their occasional dark moments, like Super Paper Mario, Earthbound, Twilight Princess, the list can go on. But oh my god. A me game to me is like the last kind of game I would expect to see grim implications in because of how casual and laid back they are most of the time. And as for what you do with the Dark Curse now, Let's just quickly talk about both options provided here. Starting with Break the Curse, which is pretty self-explanatory. Your main character charges up a Kamehameha and finally brings peace to the poor soul. Which all seems well and good, right? Well, what happens if you save the curse? Well, the poor guy gets resurrected and travels the world with the Great Sage, not only being granted a second chance at life, but also being able to atone for his wicked deeds from when he was an evil spirit. Breaking the curse does mean that you have saved the world, but that happens either way. So basically, the sin here is the option where you don't grant the guy another chance at life. Because to this day, I still find that very grim to think about. And life matters. Even yours too. Yes, you. The viewer watching. Even if you don't feel like that's true, those around you will tell you otherwise. Whether it's your friends, family, teacher, and even I'm telling you right now. I may not be a therapist, but if you ever feel like you're in a tough spot and there's nowhere you think you could turn to, I highly encourage you to speak to someone about how you're feeling whether it's someone professional or someone close to you in your personal life, and I'm positive they will do whatever they can to lead you in the right direction. You deserve the best, and as long as you are still alive, you are still capable of doing great things, whether big or small. And also, I hope this video managed to spark some joy into all of you as well, and lightened up your day a bit. Speaking of which, I finished my statement on how grim breaking the curse really is, and I still haven't cowered it to the total. So, all I can really say in conclusion to this is, I had to resurrect the Dark Curse. He deserved to be happy, and deserved better than what he got. Anyway, DING! I doubt that, because there is a post-game, and two new areas on the map. Who employed Tinky Winky here in New Lumos, and does he have any shelter to stand under while on guard here? Standing in the rain all day doesn't sound fun and worthwhile to work in. But, I killed the Dark Lord already. What are you talking about, Elma? I honestly could not think of much else to say about the post-game. I didn't see anything wrong with Galado's Isle. Well, maybe aside from the twirgle enemy you encountered midway through the area. One twerky, as I said before, was bad enough. We did not need a second one. As for New Lumos and the Gauntlet Towers at the very end, Tower of Dread is essentially a boss rush featuring the bosses you encounter throughout the entirety of New Lumos' districts. Not much to say here. But as for the Tower of Despair, it's another gauntlet of boss fights featuring goblins, golems, and etc. 
and it all caps off with one final battle against the boss snup at the very top of the tower. So, is there anything here that I personally think is sin worthy? Well, yeah there is. On the fifth floor of the Tower of Despair, you are up against two blue goddesses and a red fiend. I sinned the fiend enemies earlier with no explanation given, because I think we all know why it deserved to be counted as a sin, but the fact we have to face it one last time as a boss enemy with 4000 HP is definitely sin worthy. I kinda lost track of how many times my party members died on this floor alone. And to conclude the video, let me just say that if you want to try and go for 100% completion with the medals in this game, then good f***ing luck with that, because you have a long road of grinding ahead of you. Open 500 treasure chests, eating plus 99 to all stats, 3 max level relationships, and without a doubt, the most tedious medal to acquire in the entire game is medal number 193 which requires you to get one party member to level 50 with all 14 jobs in the game. I would be totally fine with doing this in my free time if my main source of XP didn't run away nearly every single time I encountered it.